Welcome to this week's Market Talk. I'm Amber Lancaster, joined by Paul Manpilli and Ian Dyer. Each week we look forward to sharing our viewpoints with you, our readers, and giving you insight into what's on our radar. Today's outlook is for the week of March 4th, 2019. I'll begin by sharing with you what I'm watching, and then we'll hear from Ian and Paul. Last week, fourth quarter GDP showed the U.S. economy slightly took its foot off the gas pedal at the end of last year, and that it's coasting along, but it has not come to a complete stop by any means, and this is encouraging news. Economists adjusted their fourth quarter GDP forecasts to 2.2%, but the actual reading came in above forecasts at 2.6%. The prior reading was 3.4% for the third quarter in 2018. One of the most prescient economic releases this week will be the February jobs report. Based on its reading, we'll know if the labor market is shrugging off most of the sluggish economic data reported at the end of 2018. And per Bloomberg, Economists are anticipating 185,000 jobs were added in February. This is a decrease from the 304,000 jobs added in January. And meanwhile, the February unemployment rate is forecast to move down just slightly to 3.9% versus 4% in January. And as you can see in this slide, this will be yet another busy week for economic releases. We'll see December's new home sales release on Tuesday, March 5th. February's ADP employment change, and December's a trade balance print on Wednesday, March 6th. And as mentioned earlier, the jobs report numbers on Friday, March 8th at 8.30 a.m. This week will also witness a momentous occasion in the markets. This Wednesday will mark the 10th anniversary of the longest U.S. bull market in history. As you can see in this chart, back in March 2009, the S&P tanked to a low of 666 points and has since gained 320 points through Friday's close. On the trade front, it's being reported by Bloomberg that today the U.S. and China are closing in on a deal to end most U.S. tariffs. This will happen if Beijing protects intellectual property rights and buys a large amount of American-made products. Turning to artificial intelligence, I wanted to share an interesting technology that's aiming to make China greener and I suspect could make its way to the US. It's all about recycling and its applications based on your smartphone. According to People's Daily Online, AI-powered waste management is underway in China. Xiao Wango, a smart garbage recycling platform, has rolled out more than 10,000 AI-powered waste sorting bins. These bins, now in over 30 cities in China, has gained nearly 3,000 users on its app in under one year. The People's Daily states, the AI-powered garbage sorting bin could automatically identify waste using cameras or the average density and size of items. It also pays users when they recycle metals, plastic, and paper boxes. The People's Daily also states that besides image identification and real-time payment, the smart waste sorting bins also provide services such as big data, cloud computing, and accurate locations, which enables users to trace their waste. The monitoring system will notify garbage collectors once 80% of the bin space is used and deliver waste to the sorting center, where the garbage will further be processed and transferred to factories as renewable resources. In addition to this technology, Xiaowang Go plans to establish an online shopping mall, personal credit rating system, as well as build industrial parks and chains for garbage uh, classifications. And lastly, as this graph shows, our disruptification index continues, continues to beat major indices more than two to one year to date. As of Friday's March 1st close, the index is up 27.9% versus 11% on the Dow and 11.8% on the S&P 500. So that's it for me. Ian, what are you watching? 
Thanks, Amber. So right now I'm watching Tesla, which had a lot of hype surrounding it last week. Uh, last Thursday, they actually came out with a whole bunch of announcements, but the most important announcement was that they are going to begin selling their Model 3 base model for a price of $35,000. So this is a really cheap price compared to its competitors in the electric vehicle luxury sedan market. The closest that I could find was the Volvo Polestar 2, which one, doesn't even go on sale until the end of 2020, and two, it will cost a lot more than the Model 3. It'll cost about $68,000 when it does come out. So their Tesla is ahead in terms of price and time. And by the time the Polestar 2 comes out, who knows what they'll be selling the Model 3 for, who knows what other models they'll have. So right now they really do have full control of the electric vehicle market in the United States. And the Model 3, another statistic for that was that it sold, it didn't go on sale really till July. That's when they really started mass producing it. And it still sold over one third of the electric vehicles in the United States. So this has been a huge hit and it's cheaper now. So we believe that it's going to sell even more in the future. Uh, another announcement that Tesla made was that they're switching all of their sales to online. So this disrupts the car buying industry. Uh, the, the whole process of buying a car, a lot of people think is tedious, takes a lot of time going back and forth between car dealerships and salespeople and negotiations just really wears on people. So obviously it's a lot more convenient to be able to do it in the comfort of your own home at your computer. So we've seen this with a few companies like Carvana and Auto Trader and Cars.com, but Tesla is entering into this space. So we believe that also gives them an advantage as the internet car buying industry continues to disrupt uh, things like car dealerships and the traditional car buying experience. Uh, another thing that I have my eye on right now is the IPO market. And one of the big companies that just finished uh, doing their IPO uh, information is Lyft, which is, as everybody knows, kind of the younger brother to Uber. And IPO actually was given a valuation of about $15 billion at the beginning of 2018. That valuation has now gone up to about $26 billion. So I believe that Lyft is going to have a huge effect on the IPO market. There's a lot of other companies that are planning on going public in 2019, one of which being Uber, which is IPO's biggest competitor. And Lyft is, has grown very popular in the United States. It has about 32 billion users in 2018. So we believe that I, the IPO of Lyft could really have a chain effect on the IPO market as more and more private companies that are this big continue to go public. And one of the things I've mentioned actually in Bold Profits Daily is the IPO Renaissance ETF. So this is a great way to invest in companies that have not yet gone public, but this ETF buys shares right when they do go public. So this has gone up about 34% year to date and as these companies continue to go public, uh, we believe this is gonna be a very good investment going forward. And Paul? Thanks, Ian. Yeah, the, uh, the Tesla news is really, to me, really a, a real example of this enormous movement, which you know, we call disruptification. And initially you saw it in retail and Amazon has become the symbol of it. And now Tesla moving car buying online, well, that is going to transform the car buying industry. And all the dealers that are you know, trying to work their way out to some middle world are going to be left behind. And all car transactions are eventually go going to go this way. And in fact, Elon Musk in his blog post said that no one, not GM, not, not Ford, not BMW can replicate this. Only a new startup could do this. And I can tell you, if you look at Tesla's difficulties just to stay in business during its 18 years, it's, it's really hard to be a car startup. It's, it's a very difficult industry. So the car buying industry is going to change enormously. And you saw another announcement where Amazon said that they are going to start grocery stores. And in reaction, the stocks of Kroger and others all went down. And that's because... Amazon is going to bring something very different to the grocery space, which is that 
their stores are going to be driven by data. And that's one thing that they have enormous amount of. And Kroger has data, however, would be very different. Amazon has a very direct relationship with the customer. And so their stores are going to reflect that. And once again, disruptification is spreading just from one part of the economy to the next. And anyone that thinks that they are somehow exempt or immunized is going to eventually be targeted and in the end be destroyed. Another big trend that is sitting a little bit under the radar and no one's keeping track of is the rise of manufacturing unemployment. The manufacturing employment, employment is now up for 18 months straight. And that's 274,000 non-managerial jobs. So we're talking about actual jobs where people are doing things. And some of you may have seen there was a Wall Street Journal article saying there are more Americans than in any time in the recent past making something. So just for context, the peak in manufacturing jobs was all the way in 1979 at 19.6 million jobs. And today it sits at 12.6 million. And at the very low, which was in 2010, it was 11.5 million. So also for additional context, during the last so-called expansion between 2001 and 2007, we lost 2 million manufacturing jobs. So if you've been following Bold Profits and previously Winning Investor Daily, I've told you about the industrial internet of things. This is big, very large subtrend within the internet of things megatrend. And within it are things that we talk about, 3D printing, machine vision, robotics, and even 5G. These all come to combine together to be part of this huge megatrend. And if you're in our services, you're in these stocks and you're getting the benefit of it. We've seen these stocks go up and do very well. And in fact, I have told you to invest in the Industrials ETF. And we originally told you about it in October and you'd be flat if you followed us from there. And again, I re-recommended in January of 2019 and you're up 11% since then. So this is a huge growing and I believe a mega trend that's going to continue to keep growing, which is United States going back to being an economy that makes things. And we make things in a very different way than 1979. We use very modern ways, even artificial intelligence, all these other things coming together. And now we now can make things in a way they are cheaper, easier, and have a certain complexity that really only we can really at this point put together. Another thing that's been going on in the markets that people may be missing is that biotech companies, as we told you about when I made a bold, uh, winning investor daily and told you about to buy into the biotech ETF, they've been buying up companies, specifically gene therapy companies. Three big transactions have happened. Novartis has bought Avexis for $8.7 billion. That was an 81% pop if you owned Avexis stock. Roche bought Spark Therapeutics. 4.3 billion. That was a 121% pop if you owned once. And then Biogen just today is bought Nightstar for 877 million. It's a 68% pop. So these biotechs, they need new drugs. They need new drugs in their pipeline and they're buying their small cap brethren. And these are the stocks that are in our Extreme Fortune service and our True Momentum service. So we're very interested in this because they're part of the bigger mega trend of precision medicine and the, the big biotechs are lar largely not in it and they need these small companies. Finally, I'm going to end with one last thing, which is that all of you know what happened at the end of 2018. There was essentially a gigantic panic and now we have the data to confirm it, which is that Bank of America, which tracks these things, says that the cash position in the market, in other words, the cash position in portfolio managers' cash balance accounts is the highest since January 2009. So in other words, people have behaved and are acting as if we have just gone through a 2008 style crash when, as Amber said, our economy just reported a 2.6 growth number. Unemployment is at one of the lowest levels in the last what, 30, 40 years. And people's response to that is to build cash positions. 
I can tell you from being 25 years in the market, this is one of the bull most bullish signs that you can see. Cash on the side, while there's no reason to panic, because eventually all that cash is gonna come back in and bid stocks up. So I would tell you that I'm still very optimistic. I'm very bullish for all the reasons I laid out in this. And that's all I have, and back to you, Amber. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us today. And thank you to our listeners for tuning in. And until next week, have a great day.